This is a simplified axial flux generator with only a single copper coil, and this is it lighting up a small LED array. A key characteristic of this generator is that I've made it easily adjustable by varying both the speed of rotation and also the distance of the copper coil from the magnets. I also have two different flywheels with different strength magnets on them, and two different wire coils that we'll test out. In this video, we'll see how the strength of the magnets, the speed of the magnets, and the distance of the magnets from the coils influences how much EMF we can produce with a small LEGO generator. We'll also use some small capacitors to smooth out the generator output, and to see how long it takes for different magnets to fill up a capacitor bank so that we can power some LED lights for a short time. So what is this generator built from, and how does it work? Well, let's start with the LEGO structure. This is a simple flywheel made using four of the curved Technic gear racks. This gives us a reasonably stable circular surface onto which we can mount these magnets, which I've done using some blue tack. Driving the flywheel is a series of gears to increase the input to output ratio. This area here might look a little complicated, but that's just because I also added this ratchet onto the gearbox so that I could add this lever over here. This lever is driven by an elastic band and it allows us to give it a small crank and then it'll spin the flywheel for a brief moment. Fortunately, the flywheel can still be driven independently using this little wheel here. This spins the flywheel quite rapidly with a very high input to output ratio. It's important to note here that I geared this wheel up so that I can move it fast enough to generate an appreciable voltage. The downside of this, however, is that the generator is very inefficient at translating mechanical power into electrical power. This is really not what you want when building a useful generator. This one is really just built to understand how different factors influence output. Then, feeding the copper coil into the flywheel is this simple lever here. If we push this lever, it brings the coil closer to the wheel. One of the reasons this lever is needed is because if I try to start the wheel spinning while the coil is close to the wheel, it's almost impossible to start the wheel spinning as the magnets will drag on the metal core of the coil. Speaking of the wire coils, I have two different coils here to try out, and both have a metal core. These metal cores are made of 8mm thick steel bolts that are around 30mm long. And my first coil here is 32 gauge 0.2mm copper wire, and this one is 38 gauge 0.1mm wire, so very thin. I don't know exactly how long each coil wire is, but I use the same weight of copper for both, and the 0.1mm wire certainly has quite a long length, many hundreds of meters. Finally then, we have the magnets, which are mounted on the flywheel. I have two flywheels here, one that has very small neodymium magnets, which are 5mm in diameter and 3mm thick. These are weak, but we can fit many of them around the wheel. In fact, there are 16 around this wheel. Each magnet around the wheel switches from an exposed pole, so we have an alternating north-south, north-south, etc. The second flywheel here has larger magnets, which are 20mm by 3mm. These are quite a bit stronger, and so we can't fit as many around the wheel, only 6 compared to 16. Later, we'll see which ones provide a better output for the generator at a given speed. So at this point, some of you might be wondering why use a metal core at all? Well, the reason is that a metal core is able to become magnetized by the magnets as they travel in close proximity to the metal. Because the wire loops are very close to the metal, this effectively boosts their exposure to the magnetic field, helping to drive a stronger output. So with a metal core, we can drive a stronger output than we would with an air core. There are however benefits and drawbacks to using a metal core. As we just mentioned, the primary benefit is that we can typically drive a stronger output with a metal core. The drawback though is that because these magnets are attracted to the metal core, there is significant drag created when you try to move the magnets. In fact, in this generator, it's completely unable to start if the coil is in close proximity to the flywheel. To mitigate this effect, I can start the flywheel spinning, and then bring the coil closer so that the spinning movement of the flywheel smooths out the magnetic attraction to the metal core. So let's see how the setup performs, and how the different factors influence the generator's output. 
To start with, let's take a look at the effect that distance of the magnet from the coil has on the output. To demonstrate this, I'll first test out this coil of 32 gauge wire while using the larger 20 mm magnets. First, the generator needs to be started by spinning the flywheel with the steel core and coil retracted. This will allow us to easily build some speed without creating magnetic drag. Now that we've got the flywheel spinning, we can bring the coil closer to the magnets. I've used an LED diode here as a visual indicator for the output being generated. As you can see, as we bring the coil closer, the LED begins to light up. The closer the coil is to the magnets, the brighter the LED glows. And retracting the coil dims the LED. Although it looks like the LED is flashing quite slowly, it's actually flashing a lot faster in real life. It's just the frame rate of my camera making it appear to flash a little slower. Next, let's measure the output on a multimeter to see how the distance impacts output. For this, I'm going to use this thinner 38 gauge wire coil, which will generate a higher voltage, making it easier for us to see how it's impacted. This multimeter can measure AC, so we can just hook it up directly to the outputs of the wire coil. And again, as you can see, when we bring the coil closer to the magnets, the voltage begins to climb. And at full speed, this coil seems to output eh, somewhere around 12 volts. As we retract the coil from the spinning magnets, the voltage immediately begins to drop. So now that we know what effect distance has, let's next look at how the size of the magnets affects the output. For these tests, I'm going to use the thicker 32 gauge wire, and I'm going to convert the signal from AC to DC so we can store some of the energy in some capacitors. To convert AC to DC, you first need to rectify the signal. You can make your own rectifier with diodes, but I just lazily got this single phase rectifier chip from Amazon. It has two input legs for AC and two output legs for DC. And I've also added a couple of these 50 volt capacitors to smooth out the signal for the multimeter to read. To start with, let's have a look at what voltage we can get using this 32 gauge wire and with the larger magnets here. Bear in mind that the multimeter readout will slowly keep climbing due to the capacitors storing the charge, so the smooth signal might read a little higher than without the capacitors. Here it looks like the voltage quickly climbs to around 4.5 volts, so this is likely to be around the average voltage being output at near max speed. Now let's directly compare the output of the small magnets versus the large magnets. To do this, I'm going to see how long it takes to charge a 9 volt 1 farad capacitor up to 1 volt. To keep things consistent between the two different magnet wheels, I'm going to use a motor to keep the speed the same for both wheels. This way we can be more sure that the main difference between them is just due to the size of the magnets and nothing else. We'll start with the smaller magnets. Again, the output has been rectified to DC so that it can be stored in the capacitor. And I'll attach the motor here to keep the speed consistent, and then when I bring the coil into position beside the magnets, I'll start the timer on my phone. Okay, let's go. And I'll speed this up just a little. So this took the small magnets 3 minutes and 18 seconds to bring this capacitor up to 1 volt. By the way, a 1 farad capacitor is actually pretty large. At around 3 volts, a 1 farad capacitor can keep an LED brightly lit for a few minutes and dimly lit for quite a while longer. Here's the same capacitor that I brought up to 3 volts and then added green LED to. And I'll speed up the footage here, but you can see that the LED is brightly lit for the first 3 minutes or so, and then still stays reasonably well lit after another 6 minutes. And then it'll gradually dim over the next 20 minutes or so. Next let's try the larger magnets. We'll use the same motor at exactly the same speed, and I'll start the timer when the coil is moved into its closest position to the magnets.
Okay, so this time it took 53 seconds, which is a lot quicker. So as you can see, even though there are almost three times as many magnets on the smaller magnet wheel, these larger ones are able to generate a much greater output per unit time at the same speed. And then finally, out of interest, I wanted to see if this thinner 38 gauge coil, which generates around 12 volts, is actually usable for lighting a 12 volt bulb. So I hooked it up to this 12 volt LED array with uh, a couple of capacitors to smooth out the output. And once we spin it up, yup, despite the ridiculously high resistance in this coil, it's actually able to produce enough current to light up this bulb, which is really not bad. And then over here we have our runaway magnet. So what is the takeaway here? Well, as we can see, sometimes bigger is better. Stronger magnets tend to drive greater outputs for the same speed, even at lower frequencies. And so if your primary goal is just to produce some usable output for low-powered applications, well then larger magnets are a great way to go, so long as you can smooth out the output with some capacitors. However, lower powered magnets have the benefit of being able to produce a much smoother output. If you'd like to see more of these videos, I'll have some more experiments with much larger magnets coming soon, so feel free to subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.